Hi everyone, my name is Karan Gupta and I'm the head of strategy at KG International. We are a private bearing brand and supplier of industrial and automotive aftermarket parts based out of Dubai, but catering to about 53 different countries in the world. Uh, and what a pleasure it is to be sponsoring and being a part of uh, such an innovative event, really making the most of uh, the situation we've been in over the last couple of years. Um, I think COVID taught all of us that adapting and uh, you know, being resilient and uh, keeping a laser focus on business uh, survival uh, became very clear amidst COVID times. And, uh, you know, just as things were starting to get back to normal, we saw a massive shock in the uh, Russian, uh, Russia-Ukraine war. Um, I think this is something that took the world by surprise and the escalation of events have done, have only exasperated that. And um, I think now more than ever, uh, businesses are struggling to plan against it and keep um, keep an eye on how to respond both from a humanitarian perspective and to help out given the tough situation that Ukrainians are in and also how business can be managed going forward because of course things will change pretty drastically over the next few uh, weeks as the situation unravels and um, it is very difficult to plan for uh, the future in, in a scenario like this. Um, of course, we're all faced with the same issue. And uh, I wanted to take some time to share how uh, we at KG International navigated it uh, using a rather unique or different approach um, called uh, scenario planning. Before we get into the topic, uh, I want to introduce myself a little bit. So as I mentioned, I'm the head of strategy and uh, I, joined, uh, I joined the business a few months ago and I, I'm relatively new to the aftermarket industry but, uh, and to bearings overall. Um, but my, my background comes from engineering. I got degrees in engineering mathematics in the US uh, before working as a management consultant uh, out of Chicago, focusing on growth strategy, mergers and acquisition, uh, so both organic and inorganic growth, as well as uh, driving operational efficiency. Um, so obviously this is a really interesting industry to be in, uh, given the competitiveness, given the uh, global dynamics at play. Uh, and um, Scenario planning is a tool that I learned during my consulting days for some of the biggest companies in the world. And uh, it's proving to be more important now than ever before. So I wanted to share uh, you know, what scenario planning is, how to do it, uh, how, uh, what scenarios I thought of when we're, when we're trying to plan against the Russia-Ukraine situation uh, and how you, can, how you can use this to your advantage to maintain, um, you know, maintain revenues, maintain uh, profitability and reduce risk in your business. <clears throat> so to start off, um, of course, the Russia-Ukraine war, war has been really devastating on a number of fronts. Um, I think economically, it's been a massive strain, not just to the local economy, but to the economy around the world. We've seen a heightened global inflation. We've seen a surge in commodity and raw material prices as a result of uh, supply constraints, as a, uh, as, as a result of destruction of physical infrastructure. Uh, economic sanctions. Um, of course, we know Russia is a major producer of metals and energy, so that causes a disproportionate impact on those industries. Um, supply chain disruptions, we've seen these throughout COVID as a, in the form of congestions and uh, delayed shipments, uh, you know, suddenly cancel shipments, port, um, COVID outbreaks, etc. But uh, these have become even more severe given the block of certain trade routes because of the sudden drop in demands, because of a variety of other reasons as well. Um, these issues are, though they were on the mend in the past, they're, they're back to being uh, business critical issues now. Uh, global growth has of course slowed down as people and companies step take a step back and reevaluate re uh, how to think about their business footprint, particularly as it comes to Ukraine and Russia, and uh, especially in Europe, people at a level never seen before, you know, take, taking stand, uh, making their voices heard, helping people in need. Uh, it's been truly inspiring, but as a result, uh, global growth has surely slowed down and my, my suspicion is that it will continue to do so, at least, at least until there's some clarity on how uh, the war will unravel. Russian sanctions, of course, uh, a major, major, uh, hit on the Russian economy, but as well as neighboring economies. Um, the US unveiled a series of sanctions and uh, a, a variety of European countries have also 
followed suit. And there is more than government prevention uh, this time around. We've seen a variety of companies boycotting Russia. Examples include McDonald's, um, you know, uh, people just limiting their exposure in Russia. Uh, a variety of, ma of management consulting firms have decided to divest their businesses in, in Russia. Uh, and that, of, of course, causes uh, economic shocks in various ways to the to, to those local markets. Um, lots of impacts, lots of things to uh, to be uncertain and unclear about. Um, and this is the exact scenario where uh, scenario planning can be incredibly useful. Um, so what is scenario planning? Scenario planning is a, is a differentiated approach where instead of thinking through a problem in a unilateral way, uh, which is what we call conventional wisdom, you think of it in, in a variety of different discrete, unique ways. So you think about how the world would unfold uh, in a variety of different scenarios. And you think about how those scenarios, however plausible or, or unplausible they might seem, uh, impact your business. Um, so scenarios are things are stories that stretch your thinking. They're they're not they don't necessarily have to be true. They don't necessarily have to be based on uh, what you're seeing at the moment, but they're plausible stories that could potentially unravel. Uh, scenarios are divergent, so no two scenarios are alike. Otherwise, it defeats the purpose. Each scenario should be unique and individual in its, in its own right. Uh, scenarios are hypotheses. They're guesses. They again, it could be that. One of, one of your scenarios come true. It could be that none of your scenarios come true and that's totally okay. Um, and scenarios are tools. Uh, they're tools for recognizing and adapting to change. Uh, if you're able to think through clearly uh, what your potentials, uh, potential outcomes could be, it for sure prepares you better for, under, for pivoting and keeping a track of what, what ends up playing out so that you're ready and it doesn't catch your business by surprise. Scenario planning is done uh, in, a, in a sequential but, but, but fairly logical process. Um, first of all, you have to be very clear about what the focal question is. Uh, what are you really trying to solve for? What, is the, what are the scenarios made uh, to help with? Uh, what are the driving forces that impact your scenario? So as I mentioned, each scenario is different, but what are the key differentiating factors? Uh, and generally they come in the form of trends or uncertainties. Um, what are the critical uncertainties? What are the big uh, questions within your focal question that uh, could potentially impact your business that are unclear at the moment? And then forming your scenario frameworks, forming, forming this, the frameworks and the stories for what could happen in the future. Once you, once you have those, you can think clearly through the risks, implications, and other options, and uh, what the indicators and signposts are so that you're ready to assess which story ends up panning out. Uh, scenario, scenario planning can be useful for in a variety of ways. Uh, it forces you to understand and dissect issues. Uh, I think it was Einstein who said, uh, you know, if you have 60 minutes to solve a problem, use, uh, 60, use 55 minutes to understand the problem and five minutes to solve it, right? So thinking through scenarios forces you to do exactly that. It's to think through what the problem is, what impacts the problem, what are, uh, what are the best ways to think through the issues. It forces you to think through even the most unlikely scenarios, right? If you, of course, if you're thinking of divergent scenarios, uh, not all of them will be equally likely. Not all of them will seem like the situation at hand, but, uh, but no matter how unlikely or how likely, uh, all scenarios are indeed useful because it makes you think through broader issues. Uh, and it makes sure that you can reduce risk for an, for an unlikely scenario, you know, in case that ends up panning out, at least you're ready for it. Um, it influences planning and provides a framework to think through uh, organizational responses. You know, if you if you know in different scenarios what uh, what the best countermeasures are, you can implement them quickly. Uh, and as a result, you get uh, a lot of organizational agility that that really prepares your company to deal with any economic volatility, which, uh, as we know, all of us are doing today. So. I've shared a little bit about what this scenario entails and what scenarios are. Now let's let's quickly talk through what are um, what scenarios of the future, at, at least uh, KG International is using, to think through uh, how to deal with the Russia-Ukraine war and how it'll impact our business. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the first way to think about scenarios is to think about what are the key factors 
uh, that'll change your business, um, you know, based on these scenarios. Uh, and I could think of two. One is what will the war do to bearing demand in the region? So in the long run, will they need the same number of bearings that they do now? Or, or you know, and this could be any item, not necessarily bearings, but of course that's our industry and that's what we're talking about uh, here today. Uh, so how will the demand be impacted? What specific industries will increase or re reduce their demand? What, uh, um, how many trading businesses will survive, et cetera? And the other is, what is the impact on the ability to do business in Russia? So assuming there is a demand, uh, how easy is it to cater that demand? Of course, sanctions and things like that make, uh, tend to make things very difficult. So, uh, so, so these are the two key factors, in my opinion, that really impact what your business in Russia will, or Ukraine will look like in the future. Um, now, my natural uh, progression to this is to put these on two axes and think about what scenarios come to mind. Uh, and uh, I could think of four uh, divergent scenarios in this case, which I'll walk you through right now. Um, let's start at the bottom left. Uh, this is what I call the speedy resolution scenario. So this is, I guess, the best case scenario where, uh, yes, there's war right now. Yes, we know, um, we know there's a big impact, but somehow the country is able to find a solution together, whatever that solution might be. Um, but at least the solution is found so that it leads to uh, restrictions being lifted. It, it leads to less uncertainty. It leads to uh, business ability to go back uh, um, to the way things were, to go back to status quo. And uh, so that re demand remains relatively unaltered, right? Uh, businesses have planned for this month and the last month and the next month. Uh, as close as the reality is to those plans is, of course, better for businesses and their speedy resolution would surely enable that. Now let's go one to the right to a scenario called, uh, or a scenario that I call industry contraction. So this is a scenario where uh, the ability to, uh, to impact, the ability to do business is still, um, is still okay. Uh, doing business in Russia and Ukraine still is, uh, is very doable. It's quite manageable and there's no real impact, but uh, the industry itself, the bearing demand overall has been impacted severely. Okay, so this is, this is a world where though business restrictions have, uh, subside, so you know, doing business is okay, uh, there has been an impact to various key industries, uh, you know, particularly think about metals, energy, and other big consumers, agriculture maybe, you know, a few of the big consumers. Of, uh, of bearings in, um, in those regions. Um, this would cause multiple closures and long-term decrease in bearing demand. Uh, you know, th th this is a world where various factories, various traders have had to shut down their businesses because uh, they're, they're currently overstocked and because demand has suddenly spiked downwards. Now, if we move to the top, uh, top left, this is the sort of called the opposite scenario, right? It's what I call activity contraction. So in this scenario, bearing demand actually has remained the same and rem or remained fairly similar, not no huge, um, you know, no huge reductions in bearing demand. Um, but operating in these countries has become extremely difficult, um, right? So international trade is obviously a, a big concern here and. Uh, Operations are very uncertain. So, a is because, so in this scenario, it of course, becomes more expensive to operate, but it also becomes more difficult. And businesses, especially those sitting outside of the two countries or the countries or, or the countries around, uh, you know, the Russia and Ukraine, um, they are though they may not be as impacted. The global companies outside those regions are, and uh, in that scenario. Um, trade into Russia is, is very, very restricted because though the demand exists, uh, companies have to come up with very unique routes for payments, for shipping, uh, and generally uh, the risk level um, can, start, can start outweighing the return level and it'll force a variety of com companies to rethink how they want to do business in Russia. Uh, the, the final scenario is in the top, uh, the top right. It's called what I call sustained adversity. Um, in this scenario, matters just get really, really, really bad in both regards. 
So, uh, you know, factories are hit, trading becomes really difficult and, uh, you know, more than it being um, unfeasible from a financial standpoint, it just becomes impossible to do as a result of, um, you know, infrastructure policies, sanctions, et cetera. In this scenario, um, it becomes unfeasible for companies outside Russia and Ukraine, as well as companies within to operate. And uh, global demand is, uh, is sort of put all in haywire because uh, there are closures that nobody had planned for. So those are four scenarios. I've, I've, I've shown a quick perspective on which ones I think are most likely to pan out. And my, my thought is that activity contraction is uh, is the most uh, is likely the most prevalent. I think that you know the demand for bearings uh, likely won't decrease because uh, you know some industries might decrease, some might increase, but overall, I I would imagine it would remain the same because uh, the economy needs to survive. And from what it looks like, Russia is in it for the long haul. But on the flip side, uh, I think you know these sanctions will continue. Um, you know, acts of aggression might continue. Uh, it'll become very, very difficult to operate. And I think moving money will become a, a real challenge. So, uh, you know, when when payments and supply chain is hit, uh, you know, I, I think that that's, that's the most likely uh, scenario. But of course, that could be be very wrong, as I mentioned. You know, the this is just an initial perspective, but I will, uh, to make sure I use these scenarios effectively, I need to, we need to think through all of them very carefully. We understand what the impact is to global business, to not just yourselves, but your nearing stakeholders, because that eventually will impact you and think through them very carefully. So just so you know what, uh, what ends up playing out and you're ready for it. To that end, uh, let me share a little bit about, uh, about a little bit more about these scenarios. Uh, now I'm just, I, I, I thought the best way to do this is to discuss it in, in, um, in terms of likelihood. So, um, Sustained adversity. Um, this is the scenario, just to remind you, where uh, both bearing demand uh, and ability to uh, do business in, in Russia and Ukraine uh, become extremely low or become extremely difficult. Um, in this scenario, um, you know, many businesses are drastically reducing their footprint in Russia. Um, global supply needs to be reprioritized from international companies. So all the stock and all the uh, all the production lines that were running to cater to Russian demand, they need to be reprioritized and rethought of. In some cases, that's much harder uh, than others, where where demand is uh, you know specifically for these countries. Um, businesses with disproportionately large exposure in Russia start closing down both locally and internationally, and uh, of course, it's going to be a massive impact on bearing price. Uh, you know, we'll have overstock goods um, that are intended to Russia. We'll have unused supply, though they they may, in fact, there, there are scenarios where they could even uh, decrease price because uh, because of the availability. But of course, the more likely scenario is that, uh, or the more likely impact is that uh, bearing prices will increase uh, just due to uncertainty and because um, factories or manufacturers are unable to determine which. Uh, which items to produce and at what levels uh, as business planning takes a massive hit. Um, the second scenario I'm talk about is what we call speedy, what I call speedy resolution. Uh, this is the, the best case scenario I'd mentioned where things get back to normal very quickly. Uh, you know, though I thought initially thought this was rather unlikely given the state of affairs. Uh, I think the, the most recent news we've, uh, uh, the most recent news we've heard is that um, the president of Turkey heard Russia's demands and, you know, in that light, if, if they're acceptable and um, and Russia and Ukraine are able to come to some sort of peaceful resolution, uh, this, this could end up being the most likely. Uh, but this is a best case scenario. So I think uh, things remain relatively unscathed. Um, there are, of course, short-term impacts of demand. As, we, as I mentioned, many companies have boycotted Russia. They've divested their businesses. Uh, bearing traders have some, some, you know, stopped all shipments. Payments have been stuck. Uh, hopefully, those will all ease, and there will be some short-term strain, but uh, hopefully, recoverable in the long term. Um, the third, the third scenario I want to discuss in more detail is uh, what I call industry contraction. So this is where um, the ability to do business is still okay, 
So sanctions and infrastructure, still, you know, they've they still become manageable. Um, but overall, bearing demand uh, takes a, takes a big hit because certain industries just have become much less pre prevalent. So uh, in this scenario, global demand is forced to be reallocated, uh, not just in terms of Russia to other countries and back, but even in terms of the uh, the product, the industry specific products that have been created for Russia, if, if there's massive industry flux, um, then then those need to be rethought of very carefully. And it could be an even bigger problem than just shut, than just shutting off and reopening supply because you have to think very carefully um, about uh, you know how, how what the future of the business will look like, what demand will look like, uh, you know, three, six, nine, twelve months down the line. Uh, and that can be an incredibly daunting task because it's easy to make mistakes and easy to make incorrect assumptions. Um, global bearing supply can be reallocated in this scenario because there is there is whatever that de reduction demand may look like, there is a, a reduction. So there will be excess stock, there'll be excess capacity and uh, to, be, to, to maximize uh, the value of those things, um, reallocation is necessary and may even ease current delivery constraints that are being faced across all product types and, um, and brands uh, around the world. In this scenario, credit risk is a big issue. I think uh, businesses, though they may remain, though, though they may, not, may have customer flow remaining, um, if their business exposure in shrinking industries is disproportionately high, of course, uh, the, you know, customers can't help in that scenario and we will likely see much more defaulting and, uh, and uh, cash flow issues for recipients of, uh, of, of due cash. The last one, which again, I think is the most common is what we call activity contraction. So as a reminder, this is where um, it is very difficult to do business in Russia and Ukraine, but the demand persists. Um, in this scenario, business finds, businesses are forced to find new ways to cater to the Russian demand. Uh, so, you know, luckily stocks and everything are protected and still needed, but uh, innovative solutions and partnerships and, uh, you know, interesting supply chain um, issues need to, need to be dealt with, uh, spe especially when it comes to payment. Um, though there might be a short-term impact here as, uh, as stakeholders figure out how to do this and get some clarity on what the, um, what the infrastructure available is. Uh, in the long run, this this becomes this becomes much more manageable, and people find ways around it. Of course, um, the winners here are not necessarily the people who stock better or have historically been better at purchasing or planning. The winners here are the ones who are able to navigate the supply chain um, and payments processes uh, much more effectively. Um, again, in this scenario, credit risk is an issue, but uh, I would say less of an issue as the industry con contraction scenario because though payments might be delayed while people figure this out, the demand persists. So uh, you could hope in this scenario that, uh, that payments will come at, at, at some point, even if they're, they're a bit delayed. So as you can see, in the, we came up with four scenarios that were relatively simple based on dissecting the problem into two key uh, factors, doing business in Russia and what, what happens to the impact uh, what happens to the business uh, demand long-term for bearings? Uh, and thinking through, we came up with four very unique scenarios, very different. And um, we thought through what the impact of each of those scenarios are. Um, as you can see, this is obviously just a, a much quicker exercise. Our impacts are much more detailed in this scenario, in this case, where this is just a shorter talk. Um, regardless, uh, it is easy to see the value in this analysis because now, at least at KG, we're ready to we're ready to move, uh, depending on which scenario we see playing out, uh, and are covered in terms of uh, what what the potential options could be. Um, the next step to this analysis would be to think through how you would respond as a business to each of these impacts, and what the indicators of each scenario are. In this case, it seems, and at least in my opinion, it's pretty pretty straightforward. You know, you'd look at things like. Uh, you know, industry specific hits in terms of infrastructure, in terms of, um, you know, businesses closing down, you would look at the number of sanctions in place, you look at the time for processing of payments, 
you'd look at uh, you know currency risk etc and uh, and you can make generally accurate predictions as to which one of the which one of the scenarios is playing out i think it's also important to know that it may not even be one of these scenarios playing out uh, it could just as well be that um, you know multiple of them play out together so for for example um, the sustained adversity scenario could play out even if um, there's an industry contraction but but uh, or there's an activity contraction but demand remains because it could just be that demand just cannot be supplied and it it leads to increased prices it, it leads to additional inflation and people choose to exit the industry because it's, it becomes very difficult to operate in it so in that scenario you can see that the impacts become a bit fuzzy uh, regardless at least you've thought through both options you could pick and choose which ones which of the impacts are more likely What can you do uh, to start mitigating these, um, the risk of all of, of, you know, multiple scenarios or scenarios playing out that are different to what you thought? First, uh, business planning. I think it is in increasingly important to spend more time planning and predicting demand, and more importantly, adding nimbleness and agility to your process uh, of, of business planning is, is in in very, very, very critical. Uh, so you can make decisions quickly and you can make, you can understand the impact to the rest of your business much more quickly. Uh, managing customer and end user expectations. I think that's very important. Uh, you know, oftentimes we uh, communicate the best case scenario to our customers, but in this case, it is important to make sure that everyone knows what the possibilities are, uh, what you predict might happen, what, what issues there might be in terms of um, payments, in terms of shipping, in terms of um, you know, making the right purchases and planning accordingly and how much you can in invest in stocks to dedicate to these regions. Uh, all these things, though difficult conversation to have, um, I think clarity and transparency will be uh, extremely important here. And that brings me to my next point. And in my opinion, the most important point of this talk, which is that um, the key to really get through this together is increased transparency and trust. Um, I think, you know, bearings is a very competitive industry. Uh, it's a it's an industry used to operating in, in secrecy with pricing, with uh, you know uh, different tactics by different players and being able to adapt to a really high level of competition. Uh, but if we can sort of step away from that and have some transparency, some trust, help each other in a time uh, of need, I think that'll go a much longer way now than before. And I plan to spend some more time talking about the specific element of trust uh, because of how important it is uh, in just a second. I think uh, in certain interactions, especially in times of uncertainty, we definitely saw this during COVID, but bringing the right attitude to conversations and relationships goes a very long way. Making sure that you're positive, problem solving, looking for win-wins, even if it means sacrificing short-term profits for yourself, uh, making sure that the entire ecosystem wins uh, and, and all these stakeholders you're dealing with to have a good experience is uh, more important now than ever before. Um, credit risk um, is going to be very, you know, in most of the scenarios we thought of, credit risk is a problem. Uh, so reduction or re-navigating or rethinking your credit risk in Russia and Ukraine is very, very important. I think, uh, you know, in times of COVID, we learned that business resiliency is just as important as business growth. And uh, protecting your business to serve those customers in the long run is also very important. And uh, bringing that transparency and looking for those win-wins will help solve that. Uh, of course, credit should credit will be an issue and should be to, uh, to make sure companies are protected. Uh, and the final one is to just redo your business planning and sales. I mentioned agility is important. Um, you know, we have seen the scenario playing out. When you think you have a handle on which scenario will play out, redo your sales and purchase planning. Uh, make sure that uh, all your plans take into account the scenario you think is more likely. Your opinion, of course, may be starkly different than mine in terms of which of the four scenarios will play out, or you may have even a completely different scenario, and that's great. That's totally okay. But uh, but planning your sales and purchasing against the scenario you think is most likely will be very, very effective, especially as you highlight the differences and you can take strategic calls uh, about your business. Um, hopefully all that resonates with the, with the listeners on this call. Um, as I mentioned, I think the most important of these is transparency and trust. So I wanted to spend some time 
uh, talking about uh, the trust economy and the why trust is more important now than ever before. First of all, it is abundantly clear that especially in the last couple of years, trust tr truly drives business value. Uh, PwC did a survey of 503 business leaders um, and it was clear across a multiple of dimensions and um, metrics, uh, trust uh, had a very, very stark impact. The most important of which is customer loyalty. You know, uh, we talked about the importance of business planning. If you don't have loyal customers, that business planning process becomes much, much, much uh, trickier. And trust is a, ensuring that you have the trust of your customers is extremely important um, way to retain that loyalty. Having a positive reputation, being seen as a company that uh, helps and that uh, steps up and, and, and you know, as a guiding light through issues like this uh, is very, very important. Expanding into new areas and markets. Uh, you know, if you have a good reputation, good level of trust uh, in, in, you know, in, in markets you historically operated in, it makes, it paves the road much more simply for you to enter new areas and markets, especially in a time where diversifying your uh, business risk and business footprint is extremely important. We've seen, and it, it's, it's stipulated that there's a direct impact to revenue growth, uh, a direct impact to growing your customer base, you know, customer referrals, et cetera, uh, having a big impact and, and you know, drawing more users in. Uh, you know, improving your brand equity and protection. Uh, we've seen now more than ever that, that companies that are on top of political issues, that are helping, that are being a positive influencer society, are, are much more highly valued as a brand than companies that uh, stay relative, relatively quiet. You know, we have certain clients who've been taking days off to drive refugees to and from the, to, from the border to, to their home cities, things like that have been very, very commendable and we've done our best to support where we can. Um, employee recruiting retention, you know, pe people, are now more than ever being realized as the biggest asset in a company. Um, and uh, trust is a very, very important way to get there because at the end of the day, your employees want to feel as your customers would do. They want to feel safe. They want to feel protected. They want to feel like they're cared for. Um, and also, of course, there's a direct impact between trust and access to capital and financing, especially now. Uh, you know, a, a lot of hypotheses about commercial viability, about um, you know, business growth have been tested and uh, a lot of investors and a lot of, uh, you know, institutions uh, look at trustworthiness as a, as a critical element of whether or not people are deserving of um, capital or financing. Uh, and of course, those are critical to run businesses. So, um, you know, 50% of people in the survey thought that that has a very, trust has a very direct impact uh, to that process as well. Uh, so it's it's very clear, right? Trust uh, is a guiding force for businesses in this case, and is a great way to unlock growth. Now, how do you build trust? There are a few key points I wanted to highlight, right? Uh, one is being authentic in your leadership and governance. Um, we face in our company all the time where you know ex excess governance can be seen as lack of trust, but of course you've got to find the middle ground and uh, governance is important, uh, but trust is equally important. So we continue to work to make sure that we can find what the right balance is. Um, compliance, safety, and security programs. Uh, you know, again, these are important. These have always been important, but they're more important now than before. Uh, making, making people convinced that your systems protect them as well as the company is very, very important and important to be genuine with how those systems are, are, are helping employees uh, as well as your company resiliency. Um, technology innovation, I, it, you know, it seems counterproductive, especially with all this talk about cybersecurity and data and all that, but, uh, you know, using technology effectively, innovating, making sure you're looking for ways to better cater to your customers and your employees uh, is highly rewarded. And uh, you know, it, it always has been and it continues to be. And uh, there, there's, there's a level of trust uh, when dealing with or working at companies 
that uh, that uh, spend significant uh, resources towards uh, tech and innovation growth. Accountability and adherence to ethical standards. Uh, I think you know we're lucky in our company. It's very clear to everyone that we will sacrifice revenue, but we will not do unethical. We will not contribute to unethical practices. Um, and uh, employees are very empowered to make sure that um, th that they do that, that that they focus on what's ethical versus what uh, drives uh, growth and profitability. Uh, and we continue to focus our messaging and our efforts around um, building that um, that consistency in our, in our company, our system. Uh, collaboration and transparency, I mentioned this previously, bringing a good attitude, uh, working together, solving problems together, and, and, and being, uh, being a helpful force to uh, all stakeholders in, your, in our industry is, is very, very important. And that comes with speaking, being transparent, sharing data uh, and, and you know, being, being able to be safe in these environments. Um, prioritizing customer relationship and product quality. Uh, you know, as I said, loyalty is very, very important. Um, uh, keeping your customers is more than just uh, offering the best prices and, uh, you know, uh, um, having the best commercial terms for, for these customers. It, it goes beyond that and it goes to how deep your relationship is how much, how supportive you are, how aligned with you, you are with your uh, customer's ethos. Um, financial reporting transparency, always extremely important, always has been, always will be. Um, employee men mental and physical health, making sure that your employees are protected, making sure you're taking care of the people around you. Uh, that uh, if that's clear in an, organiz in an organization, that gets, uh, that has a butterfly effect and, 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 and very clearly shows in your, uh, in your external uh, communication, external reputation as well. And uh, of course, uh, managing your third party relationships, making sure you're dealing with the right people who do business in the right way. You know, there are many times that companies are, you know, are, are doing the right things, but they're working with people who don't stand by the same principles and ethos and, um, you know, that ends up hurting their, their reputation, their trust, um, just as much as if they were doing it themselves. And reassessing that constantly, making sure that there's resilience in these relationships is very, very important. Um, I, hope, uh, I hope this is, this is pr proved to be a very useful tool uh, and that uh, I've given some thoughts on what, the, what this scenario and what, uh, what the future might look like uh, and, and how we can start preparing. Uh, please reach out through any of our customer channels uh, if you have any further questions, but uh, I will be around for the Q&A. See you then.